Story five of The House with the Mezzanine and Other Stories by Anton Chekhov, translated by S. S. Kotelyansky, eighteen eighty nineteen fifty five. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story five The Lady with the Toy Dog. It was reported that a new face had been seen on the quay, a lady with a little dog. Dmitri Dmitrievich Komov, who had been a fortnight at Talta, and had got used to it, had begun to show an interest in new faces. As he sat in the pavilion at Vernay's, he saw a young lady, blonde and fairly tall, and wearing a broad-wormed hat, pass along the quay. After her ran a white Pomeranian. Later he saw her in the park, and in the square several times a day. She walked by herself, always in the same broad-brimmed hat, and with this white dog. Nobody knew who she was, and she was spoken of as the lady with the toy dog. If, thought Gomov, if she is here without a husband or a friend, it would be as well to make her acquaintance. He was not yet forty, but he had a daughter of twelve and two boys at school. He had married young, in his second year at the university, and now his wife seemed half as old again as himself. She was a tall woman, with dark eyebrows, erect, grave, stolid, and she thought herself an intellectual woman. She read a great deal, called her husband not Dmitri, but Dmitri, and in his private mind he thought her short-witted, narrow-minded, and ungracious. He was afraid of her, and disliked being at home. He had begun to betray her with other women long ago, betrayed her frequently, and probably for that reason nearly always spoke ill of women, and when they were discussed in his presence he would maintain that they were an inferior race. It seemed to him that his experience was bitter enough to give him the right to call them any name he liked, but he could not live a couple of days without the inferior race. With men he was bored and ill at ease, cold and unable to talk, but when he was with women he felt easy and knew what to talk about and how to behave, and even when he was silent with them he felt quite comfortable. In his appearance, as in his character, indeed in his whole nature, there was something attractive, indefinable, which drew women to him and charmed them. He knew it and he too was drawn by some mysterious power to them. His frequent and indeed bitter experiences had taught him long ago that every affair of that kind, at first a divine diversion, a delicious smooth adventure, is in the end a source of worry for a decent man, especially for men like those at Moscow, who are slow to move, irresolute, domesticated, for it becomes, at last, an acute and extraordinary complicated problem and a nuisance. But whenever he met and was interested in a new woman, then his experience would slip away from his memory, and he would long to live, and everything would seem so simple and amusing. And so it happened that one evening he dined in the gardens, and the lady in the broad-brimmed hat, came up at a leisurely pace, and sat at the next table. Her expression, her gait, her dress, her coiffure told him that she belonged to society, that she was married, that she was paying her first visit to Talta, that she was alone, and that she was bored. There is a great deal of untruth in the gossip about the immorality of the place. He scorned such tales knowing that they were for the most part concocted by people who would be only too ready to sin if they had the chance. But when the lady sat down at the next table, only a yard or two away from him, his thoughts were filled with tales of easy conquests, of trips to the mountains, and he was suddenly possessed by the alluring idea of a quick transitory liaison, a moment's affair with an unknown woman whom he knew not even by name. He beckoned to the little dog, and when it came to him, wagged his finger at it. The dog began to growl. Gomov again wagged his finger. The lady glanced at him, and at once cast her eyes down. "'He won't bite,' she said, and blushed. 
"'May I give him a bone?' And when she nodded emphatically, he asked affably, "'Have you been in Talta long?' "'About five days. And I am just dragging through my second week.' They were silent for a while. "'Time goes quickly,' she said, "'and it is amazingly boring here.' "'It is the usual thing to say that it is boring here. People live quite happily in dull places like Bielev or Zidra, but as soon as they come here they say, "'How boring it is, the very dregs of dullness! One would think they came from Spain.' She smiled, then both went on eating in silence, as though they did not know each other. But after dinner they went off together, and then began an easy, playful conversation, as though they were perfectly happy, and it was all one to them where they went or what they talked of. They walked and talked of how the sea was strangely luminous, the water-lilac so soft and warm, and athwart it the moon cast a golden streak. They said how stifling it was after the hot day. Gamov told her how he came from Moscow and was a philologist by education, but in a bank by profession, and how he had once wanted to sing an opera, but gave it up, and how he had two houses in Moscow. And from her he learned that she came from Petersburg, was born there, but married at S., where she had been living for the last two years, that she would stay another month at Talta, and perhaps her husband would come for her, because he, too, needed a rest. She could not tell him what her husband was, provincial administration or Zemsvo council, and she seemed to think it funny. And Gamov found out that her name was Anna Sergueyevna. In his room at night he thought of her and how they would meet next day. They must do so. As he was going to sleep, it struck him that she could only lately have left school, and had been at her lessons even as his daughter was then. He remembered how bashful and gauche she was when she laughed and talked with a stranger. It must be, he thought, the first time she had been alone, and in such a place, with men walking after her, and looking at her, and talking to her, all with the same secret purpose which she could not but guess. He thought of her slender white neck and her pretty grey eyes. There is something touching about her, he thought, as he began to fall asleep. 2. A week passed. It was a blazing day. Indoors it was stifling, and in the streets the dust whirled along. All day long he was plagued with thirst, and he came into the pavilion every few minutes and offered Anna Sergueyevna an iced drink or an ice. It was impossibly hot. In the evening, when the air was fresher, they walked to the jetty to see the steamer come in. There was quite a crowd all gathered to meet somebody, for they carried bouquets, and among them were clearly marked the peculiarities of Talta. The elderly ladies were youngly dressed, and there were many generals. The sea was rough, and the steamer was late, and before it turned into the jetty it had to do a great deal of manoeuvring. Anna Sergueyevna looked through her lorgnette at the steamer and the passengers as though she were looking for friends, and when she turned to Gamov her eyes shone. She talked much, and her questions were abrupt, and she forgot what she had said, and then she lost her lorgnette in the crowd. The well-dressed people went away. The wind dropped, and Gamov and Anna Sergueyevna stood as though they were waiting for somebody to come from the steamer. Anna Sergueyevna was silent. She smelled her flowers, and did not look at Gamov. "'The weather has got pleasanter toward evening,' he said. Where shall we go now? Shall we take a carriage?" She did not answer. He fixed his eyes on her, and suddenly embraced her, and kissed her lips, and he was kindled with the perfume and the moisture of the flowers. At once he started and looked round. Had not someone seen? "'Let us go to your—' he murmured, and they walked quickly away. Her room was stifling, and smelled of scents which she had bought at the Japanese shop. Gamov looked at her and thought, what strange chances there are in life. 
From the past there came the memory of earlier good natured women, gay in their love, grateful to him for their happiness, short though it might be, and of others, like his wife, who loved without sincerity and talked over much and affectedly, hysterically, as though they were protesting that it was not love, nor passion, but something more important, and of the few beautiful cold women into whose eyes there would flash suddenly a fierce expression, a stubborn desire to take, to snatch from life more than it can give. They were no longer in their first youth, they were capricious, unstable, domineering, imprudent, and when Gamov became cold toward them, then their beauty aroused him to hatred, and the lace on their lingerie reminded him of the scales of fish. But here there was the shyness and awkwardness of inexperienced youth, a feeling of constraint, an impression of perplexity and wonder, as though someone had suddenly knocked at the door. Anna Sergueyevna, the lady with the toy dog, took what had happened somehow seriously, with a particular gravity, as though thinking that this was her downfall, and very strange and improper. Her features seemed to sink and wither, and on either side of her face her long hair hung mournfully down. She sat crestfallen and musing, exactly like a woman taken in sin in some old picture. "'It is not right,' she said. "'You are the first to lose respect for me.' There was a melon on the table. Gamov cut a slice and began to eat it slowly. At least half an hour passed in silence. Anna Sergueyevna was very touching. She irradiated the purity of a simple, devout, inexperienced woman. The solitary candle on the table hardly lighted her face, but it showed her very wretched. "'Why should I cease to respect you?' asked Gamov. "'You don't know what you are saying.' "'God, forgive me,' she said, and her eyes filled with tears. "'It is horrible.' "'You seem to want to justify yourself.' "'But how can I justify myself? I am a wicked, low woman, and I despise myself. I have no thought of justifying myself.' It is not my husband that I have deceived, but myself, and not only now, but for a long time past. My husband may be a good, honest man, but he is a lackey. I do not know what work he does, but I do know that he is a lackey in his soul. I was twenty when I married him. I was overcome by curiosity. I longed for something. Surely, I said to myself, there is another kind of life. I longed to live, to live and to live. Curiosity burned me up. You do not understand it, but I swear by God I could no longer control myself. Something strange was going on in me. I could not hold myself in. I told my husband that I was ill and came here. And here I have been walking about dizzily, like a lunatic and now I have become a low, filthy woman whom everybody may despise. Gamov was already bored. Her simple words irritated him with their unexpected and inappropriate repentance. But for the tears in her eyes he might have thought her to be joking or playing a part. "'I do not understand,' he said quietly. "'What do you want?' She hid her face in his bosom and pressed close to him. Believe, believe me, I implore you, she said. I love a pure, honest life, and sin is revolting to me. I don't know myself what I am doing. Simple people say, the devil entrapped me, and I can say of myself, the evil one tempted me. Don't, don't, he murmured. He looked into her staring, frightened eyes, kissed her, spoke quietly and tenderly, and gradually quieted her, and she was happy again, and they both began to laugh. Later, when they went out, there was not a soul on the quay. The town, with its cypresses, looked like a city of the dead, but the sea still roared and broke against the shore. A boat swung on the waves, and in it sleepily twinkled the light of a lantern. They found a cab and drove out to the Orianda. 
"Just now in the hall," said Gomov, "I discovered your name written on the board. Von Didenitz. Is your husband a German?" "No. His grandfather, I believe, was a German, but he himself is an Orthodox Russian." At Oreanda they sat on a bench, not far from the church, looked down at the sea, and were silent. Talta was hardly visible through the morning mist. The tops of the hills were shrouded in motionless white clouds. The leaves of the trees never stirred, the cicadas trilled, and the monotonous, dull sound of the sea, coming up from below, spoke of the rest, the eternal sleep awaiting us. So the sea roared when there was neither Talta nor Orienda, and so it roars, and will roar, dully, indifferently, when we shall be no more. And in this continual indifference to the life and death of each of us lives pent up the pledge of our eternal salvation, of the uninterrupted movement of life on earth, and its unceasing perfection. Sitting side by side with a young woman, who in the dawn seemed so beautiful, Gamov, appeased and enchanted by the sight of the fairy scene, the sea, the mountains, the clouds, the wide sky, thought how at bottom, if it were thoroughly explored, everything on earth was beautiful, everything except what we ourselves think and do when we forget the higher purposes of life and our own human dignity. A man came up, a coast guard, gave a look at them, then went away. He, too, seemed mysterious and enchanted. A steamer came over from Feodosia, by the light of the morning star, its own lights already put out. "'There is dew on the grass,' said Anna Sergueyevna, after a moment. "'Yes, it is time to go home.' They returned to the town. Then every afternoon they met on the quay, and lunched together, dined, walked, enjoyed the sea. She complained that she slept badly, that her heart beat alarmingly. She would ask the same question over and over again, and was troubled now by jealousy, now by fear, that he did not sufficiently respect her. And often in the square or the gardens, when there was no one near, he would draw her close and kiss her passionately. Their complete idleness, these kisses in the full daylight, given timidly and fearfully lest anyone should see, the heat, the smell of the sea, and the continual brilliant parade of leisured, well-dressed, well-fed people, almost regenerated him. He would tell Anna Sergueyevna how delightful she was, how tempting. He was impatiently passionate never left her side, and she would often brood and even ask him to confess that he did not respect her, did not love her at all, and only saw in her a loose woman. Almost every evening, rather late, they would drive out of the town to Orianda or to the waterfall, and these drives were always delightful, and the impressions won during them were always beautiful and sublime. They expected her husband to come, but he sent a letter in which he said that his eyes were bad and implored his wife to come home. Anna Sergueyevna began to worry. "'It is a good thing I am going away,' she would say to Gamov. "'It is fate.' She went in a carriage, and he accompanied her. They drove for a whole day. When she took her seat in the car of an express train, and when the second bell sounded, she said, let me have another look at you, just one more look, just as you are. She did not cry, but was sad and low-spirited, and her lips trembled. I will think of you, often, she said. Good-bye, good-bye. Don't think ill of me. We part forever. We must, because we ought not to have met at all. Now, good-bye. The train moved off rapidly. Its lights disappeared, and in a minute or two the sound of it was lost, as though everything were agreed to put an end to this sweet, oblivious madness. Left alone on the platform, looking into the darkness, Gamov heard the trilling of the grasshoppers and the humming of the telegraph wires, and felt as though he had just woke up. 
and he thought that it had been one more adventure, one more affair, and it also was finished and had left only a memory. He was moved, sad, and filled with a faint remorse. Surely the young woman, whom he would never see again, had not been happy with him. He had been kind to her, friendly and sincere, but still in his attitude toward her, in his tone and caresses, there had always been a thin shadow of raillery, and rather rough arrogance of the successful male aggravated by the fact that he was twice as old as she. And all the time she had called him kind, and remarkable, and noble, so that he was never really himself to her, and had involuntarily deceived her. Here at the station the smell of autumn was in the air, and the evening was cool. It is time for me to go north, thought Gamov, as he left the platform. It is time. 3. At home in Moscow it was already like winter. The stoves were heated, and in the mornings, when the children were getting ready to go to school and had their tea, it was dark, and their nurse lighted the lamp for a short while. The frost had already begun. When the first snow falls, the first day of driving in sledges, it is good to see the white earth, the white roofs, one breathes easily, eagerly, and then one remembers the days of youth. The old lime-trees and birches, white with hoar-frost, have a kindly expression. They are nearer to the heart than cypresses and palm-trees, and with the dear familiar trees there is no need to think of mountains and the sea. Gamov was a native of Moscow. He returned to Moscow on a fine frosty day, and when he donned his fur coat and warm gloves, and took a stroll through Petrovka, and when on Saturday evening he heard the church bells ringing, then his recent travels and the places he had visited lost all their charm. Little by little he sank back into Moscow life, read eagerly three newspapers a day, and said that he did not read Moscow papers as a matter of principle. He was drawn into a round of restaurants, clubs, dinner-parties, parties. He was flattered to have his house frequented by famous lawyers and actors, and to play cards with a professor at the university club. He could eat a whole plate of hot silienka. And so a month would pass, and Anna Sergueyevna, he thought, would be lost in the mists of memory, and only rarely would she visit his dreams with her touching smile, just as other women had done. But more than a month passed, full winter came, and in his memory everything was clear, as though he had parted from Anna Sergueyevna only yesterday, and his memory was lit by a light that grew ever stronger. No matter how, through the voices of his children saying their lessons, penetrating to the evening stillness of his study, through hearing a song, or the music in a restaurant, or the snowstorm howling in the chimney, suddenly the whole thing would come to life again in his memory. The meeting on the jetty, the early morning with the mists on the mountains, the steamer from Feodosia, and their kisses. He would pace up and down his room, and remember it all, and smile, and then his memories would drift into dreams, and the past was confused in his imagination with the future. He did not dream at night of Anna Sergueyevna, but she followed him everywhere, like a shadow watching him. As he shut his eyes he could see her vividly, and she seemed handsomer, tenderer, younger than in reality. And he seemed to himself better than he had been at Talta. In the evenings she would look at him from the bookcase, from the fireplace, from the corner. He could hear her breathing and the soft rustle of her dress. In the street he would gaze at women's faces to see if there were not one like her. He was filled with a great longing to share his memories with someone but at home it was impossible to speak of his love, and away from home there was no one. Impossible to talk of her to the other people in the house and the men at the bank. And talk of what? Had he loved, then? 
Was there anything fine, romantic, or elevating, or even interesting in his relations with Anna Sergueyevna? And he would speak vaguely of love, of women, and nobody guessed what was the matter, and only his wife would raise her dark eyebrows and say, Dmitri, the role of coxcomb does not suit you at all. One night, as he was coming out of the club with his partner, an official, he could not help saying, If only I could tell what a fascinating woman I met at Talta. The official seated himself in his sledge and drove off, but suddenly called, Dmitri Dmitrich. Yes, you were right. The sturgeon was tainted. These banal words suddenly roused Gomov's indignation. They seemed to him degrading and impure. What barbarous customs and people! What preposterous nights! What dull, empty days! Furious card-playing, gourmandizing, drinking, endless conversations about the same things, futile activities and conversations, taking up the best part of the day, and all the best of a man's forces, leaving only a stunted, wingless life, just rubbish. And to go away and escape was impossible. One might as well be in a lunatic asylum, or in prison with hard labor. Gomov did not sleep that night, but lay burning with indignation, and then all next day he had a headache. And the following night he slept badly, sitting up in bed and thinking, or pacing from corner to corner of his room. His children bored him, the bank bored him, and he had no desire to go out or to speak to anyone. In December, when the holidays came, he prepared to go on a journey, and told his wife he was going to Petersburg to present a petition for a young friend of his, and went to S. Why? He did not know. He wanted to see Anna Sergueyevna, to talk to her, and, if possible, to arrange an assignation. He arrived at S. in the morning, and occupied the best room in the hotel, where the whole floor was covered with a grey canvas, and on the table there stood an inkstand, grey with dust, adorned with a horseman on a headless horse, holding a net in his raised hand. The porter gave him the necessary information. Von Didenetz, Old Gusherow Street, his own house, not far from the hotel. Lives well, has his own horses, everyone knows him. Gamov walked slowly to Old Gushino Street and found the house. In front of it was a long grey fence spiked with nails. No getting over a fence like that, thought Gamov, glancing from the windows to the fence. He thought, today is a holiday, and her husband is probably at home. Besides, it would be tactless to call and upset her. If he sent a note, then it might fall into her husband's hands and spoil everything. It would be better to wait for an opportunity. And he kept on walking up and down the street and round the fence, waiting for his opportunity. He saw a beggar go in at the gate and the dogs attack him. He heard a piano and the sounds came faintly to his ears. It must be Anna Sergueyevna playing. The door suddenly opened, and out of it came an old woman, and after her ran the familiar white Pomeranian. Gamov wanted to call the dog, but his heart suddenly began to thump, and in his agitation he could not remember the dog's name. He walked on, and more and more he hated the grey fence, and thought with a gust of irritation that Anna Sergueyevna had already forgotten him, and was perhaps already amusing herself with someone else, as would be only natural in a young woman forced from morning to night to behold the accursed fence. He returned to his room, and sat for a long time on the sofa, not knowing what to do. Then he dined, and afterwards slept for a long while. How idiotic and tiresome it all is, he thought, as he awoke and saw the dark windows, for it was evening. I've had sleep enough, and what shall I do to-night? He sat on his bed, which was covered with a cheap grey blanket, exactly like those used in a hospital, and tormented himself. So much for the lady with a toy dog, so much for the great adventure. 
Here you sit. However, in the morning, at the station, his eyes had been caught by a poster with large letters. First performance of the geisha. He remembered that and went to the theatre. It is quite possible she will go to the first performance, he thought. The theatre was full, and as usual in all provincial theatres, there was a thick mist above the lights. The gallery was noisily restless. In the first row before the opening of the performance stood the local dandies with their hands behind their backs, and there in the governor's box, in front, sat the governor's daughter, and the governor himself sat modestly behind the curtain, and only his hands were visible. The curtain quivered, the orchestra tuned up for a long time, and while the audience were coming in and taking their places, Gamov gazed eagerly round. At last Anna Sergueyevna came in. She took her seat in the third row, and when Gamov glanced at her, his heart ached, and he knew that for him there was no one in the whole world nearer, dearer, and more important than she. She was lost in this provincial rabble, the little undistinguished woman with a common lorgnette in her hands, yet she filled his whole life. She was his grief, his joy, his only happiness, and he longed for her. And through the noise of the bad orchestra, with its tenth-rate fiddles, he thought how dear she was to him. He thought and dreamed. With Anna Sergueyevna there came in a young man with short side-whiskers, very tall, stooping. With every movement he shook and bowed continually. Probably he was the husband whom, in a bitter mood at Talta, she had called a lackey. And indeed, in his long figure, his side-whiskers, the little bald patch on the top of his head, there was something of the lackey. He had a modest, sugary smile, and in his buttonhole he wore a university badge exactly like a lackey's number. In the first entr'acte the husband went out to smoke, and she was left alone. Gamov, who was also in the pit, came up to her and said, in a trembling voice, with a forced smile, "'How do you do?' She looked up at him and went pale. Then she glanced at him again in terror, not believing her eyes, clasped her fan and lorgnette tightly together, apparently struggling to keep herself from fainting. Both were silent. She sat, he stood frightened by her emotion, not daring to sit down beside her. The fiddles and flutes began to play, and suddenly it seemed to them as though all the people in the boxes were looking at them. She got up and walked quickly to the exit. He followed, and both walked absently along the corridors, down the stairs, up the stairs, with the crowd shifting and shimmering before their eyes all kinds of uniforms, judges, teachers, crown estates, and all with badges. Ladies shone and shimmered before them, like fur coats on moving rows of clothes-pegs, and there was a draught howling through the place, laden with the smell of tobacco and cigar-ends. And Gamov, whose heart was thudding wildly, thought, Oh, Lord, why all these men and that beastly orchestra? At that very moment he remembered how, when he had seen Anna Sergueyevna off that evening at the station, he had said to himself that everything was over between them, and they would never meet again. And now how far off they were from the end! On a narrow dark staircase over which was written, This way to the amphitheatre, she stopped. "'How you frightened me!' she said, breathing heavily, still pale and apparently stupefied. "'Oh, how you frightened me! I am nearly dead. Why did you come? Why?' "'Understand me, Anna,' he whispered quickly. "'I implore you to understand.' She looked at him fearfully, in entreaty, with love in her eyes, gazing fixedly to gather up in her memory every one of his features. "'I suffer so,' she went on, not listening to him. "'All the time I thought only of you. I lived with thoughts of you. I wanted to forget, to forget. But why, why did you come?' A little above them, on the landing, 
two schoolboys stood and smoked and looked down at them, but Gomov did not care. He drew her to him and began to kiss her cheeks, her hands. "'What are you doing? What are you doing?' she said in terror, thrusting him away. "'We were both mad. Go away to-night. You must go away at once. I implore you, by everything you hold sacred, I implore you. The, the people are coming.' Someone passed them on the stairs. "'You must go away.' Anna Sergueyevna went on in a whisper. Do you hear, Dmitri Dmitrich? I'll come to you in Moscow. I never was happy. Now I am unhappy, and I shall never, never be happy. Never. Don't make me suffer even more. I swear I'll come to Moscow. And now let us part. My dear, dearest darling, let us part. She pressed his hand and began to go quickly downstairs, all the while looking back at him, and in her eyes plainly showed that she was most unhappy. Gamov stood for a while, listened. Then, when all was quiet, he found his coat and left the theatre. 4. And Anna Sergueyevna began to come to him in Moscow. Once every two or three months she would leave at telling her husband that she was going to consult a specialist in women's diseases. Her husband half believed and half disbelieved her. At Moscow she would stay at the Slavyansky Bazaar and send a message at once to Gamov. He would come to her, and nobody in Moscow knew. Once, as he was going to her as usual one winter morning, he had not received her message the night before, he had his daughter with him, for he was taking her to school, which was on the way. Great wet flakes of snow were falling. Three degrees above freezing, he said, and still the snow is falling. But the warmth is only on the surface of the earth. In the upper strata of the atmosphere there is quite a different temperature. Yes, papa, why is there no thunder in winter? He explained this, too, and as he spoke he thought of his assignation, and that not a living soul knew of it, or ever would know. He had two lives, one obvious, which every one could see and know, if they were sufficiently interested, a life full of conventional truth and conventional fraud, exactly like the lives of his friends and acquaintances, and another, which moved underground and by a strange conspiracy of circumstances everything that was to him important interesting vital everything that enabled him to be sincere and denied self-deception and was the very core of his being must dwell hidden away from others and everything that made him false a mere shape in which he hid himself in order to conceal the truth as for instance his work in the bank arguments at the club, his favorite jibe about women, going to parties with his wife, all this was open. And judging others by himself, he did not believe the things he saw, and assumed that everybody else also had his real vital life passing under a veil of mystery as under the cover of the night. Every man's intimate existence is kept mysterious, and, perhaps in part because of that, civilized people are so nervously anxious that a personal secret should be respected. When he left his daughter at school, Kamov went to the Slavyansky Bazaar. He took off his fur coat downstairs, went up and knocked quietly at the door. Anna Sergueyevna, wearing his favorite gray dress, tired by the journey, had been expecting him to come all night. She was pale, and looked at him without a smile, and flung herself on his breast as soon as he entered. Their kiss was long and lingering, as though they had not seen each other for a couple of years. "'Well, how are you getting on down there?' he asked. "'What is your news?' W "'Wait, I'll tell you presently. I, I cannot.' She could not speak, for she was weeping. She turned her face from him and dried her eyes. Well, let her cry a bit. I'll wait, he thought, and sat down. Then he rang and ordered tea, 
and then as he drank it she stood and gazed out of the window. She was weeping, in distress, in the bitter knowledge that their life had fallen out so sadly, only seeing each other in secret, hiding themselves away like thieves. Was not their life crushed? "'Don't cry, don't cry,' he said. It was clear to him that their love was yet far from its end, which there was no seeing. Anna Sergoevna was more and more passionately attached to him. She adored him, and it was inconceivable that he should tell her that their love must some day end. She would not believe it. He came up to her and patted her shoulder fondly, and at that moment he saw himself in the mirror. His hair was already going grey, and it seemed strange to him that in the last few years he should have got so old and ugly. Her shoulders were warm and trembled to his touch. He was suddenly filled with pity for her life, still so warm and beautiful, but probably beginning to fade and wither like his own. Why should she love him so much? He always seemed to women not what he really was, and they loved in him, not himself, but the creature of their imagination, the thing they hankered for in life. And when they had discovered their mistake, still they loved him, and not one of them was happy with him. Time passed. He met women and was friends with them, went further, and parted, but never once did he love. There was everything but love. And now at last, when his hair was grey, he had fallen in love, real love, for the first time in his life. Anna Sergueyevna and he loved one another, like dear kindred, like husband and wife, like devoted friends. It seemed to them that fate had destined them for one another, and it was inconceivable that he should have a wife, she a husband. They were like two birds of passage, a male and a female, which had been caught and forced to live in separate cages. They had forgiven each other all the past of which they were ashamed. They forgave everything in the present, and they felt that their love had changed both of them. Formerly, when he felt a melancholy compunction, he used to comfort himself with all kinds of arguments, just as they happened to cross his mind but now he was far removed from any such ideas. He was filled with a profound pity, and he desired to be tender and sincere. "'Don't cry, my darling,' he said. "'You have cried enough. Now let us talk, and see if we can't find some way out.' Then they talked it all over, and tried to discover some means of avoiding the necessity for concealment and deception, and the torment of living in different towns, and of not seeing each other for a long time. How could they shake off these intolerable fetters? How? How? he asked, holding his head in his hands. How? and it seemed that but a little while and the solution would be found and there would begin a lovely new life and to both of them it was clear that the end was still very far off and that their hardest and most difficult period was only just beginning end of story five